Welcome to File Exchange, a channel dedicated to elevating the voices of artists, writers, and curators who have a focus on art made with 3D software. This channel allows you to be a fly on the wall as we share philosophies, tools, and tips revolving around these 21st century tools in art. I'm Colette Robbins, and this is my co-host, Sophie Kahn. As hybrid digital analog sculptors, we are always excited to see what working files are behind the art of our guests. And Sophie is going to introduce our guest today. Okay, so welcome. Today we are speaking with Nadav Asur. Welcome, Nadav. Um, uh, Nadav lives and works in Providence, Rhode Island. His work takes on systems of technological mediation that are frequently military industrial in origin, from eye tracking cameras to drones, telepresence robots, and mixed reality environments. He's an associate professor of expanded media at Connecticut College's studio art department, where I had the fun experience of being a visiting artist and exhibiting a while ago, um, quite a while ago, actually. Yeah, I think you were yeah. one of uh, <laughs> the first ones after I came yeah, there. Yeah, 2015. Yeah. Wow, it was, it, was, it was a long time ago. Um, and he is also the director of the Ammerman Center for Arts and Technology there, and is a recent fellow at the Open Documentary Lab at MIT. So welcome. We're excited to talk to you today. Thank Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and I'm glad we, we managed to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. This one was inspiring. very dicey to get <laughs> schedules. Scheduling, ske <laughs> yeah. we, there was illness, there was construction, but we- So like, many we things. Through. Yeah, but yeah. we're here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah, so feel free to share a project you'd like to chat about. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of where you come from with your practice and how you incorporate 3D. Sure. Mm. So, you know, right before we started, I was I was giving you a line that apparently a lot of people give you, which is like, <laughs> I work with 3D differently. So I'm not sure this is like it. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, we'll see what your opinion is by the end of this. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I was, I, I, I never present myself as like, I, you know, I'm a 3D artist or I work with 3D uh, uh, mm. or, but, but I never even present myself as I'm a video artist, even though most of what I make is videos. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it, it's really what it comes down to is um, pretty much all of my work comes from this, um, pretty intense engagement with the body, which is, you know, mm. I know something you two know something yeah. about. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, but even more than the body, it's like has to do with movement, I think. And that's why it's time-based usually, mm -hmm. or always actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it started, so my, the very first, I was trying to think about like, you know how i've worked with 3d over the years and it's it's interesting because it is the very first projects i've shown like ever like you know <laughs> to a to a to a mm -hmm. real public audience were already using uh actually kind of digital 3d tools but in, yeah. again in this very odd kind of patched together way uh because i started my way in the art world from doing live performances that's kind of mm -hmm. oh from, right from, from right, that right, right. kind of uh, yeah. direction uh, you know body-based things in time yeah. but using yeah. sound and video right so i would do yeah. these kind of uh you know what used to be called live cinema or we had all kinds of names for that mm -hmm. back in the mm -hmm. uh, early mm -hmm. 2000s uh yeah. so um, so I found, I dug up, it's like, the, I think it's like the first thing I uploaded to YouTube and it's oh, cool. private. Yeah, and yeah. I was like a little embarrassed, but you know, I, I figured it, this would be a good place to share that. This That's is really the really exact place you want to share like this. 15 year yes. old uh, performance. I love yeah. this. Totally, totally. <laughs> so I thought that would be I, a good first file. Um, perfect. No, I definitely love that idea of performance's connection with 3D as well, because there is such a, I mean, it, for all of us who have used it, it's just like getting in there. There's a physicality to being in this simulated 3D space. So this is really interesting, mm -hmm. an interesting mm -hmm. entry point. I also came in from a back door too. <laughs> He came in as a painter, so oh, cool. Nadav, don't, don't uh, you know, you're not alone in that way. I did not study any digital technologies until my 30s. That's very cool. So, so 
Let's yeah. see. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see. For some reason, it's not showing me your faces. Oh, that's okay. We we can see it at this end. That's, yeah. I'm hearing your that's voice. That's fine. So here, I'll, yeah. I'll play it and we can we can talk over it. I'll, I'll lower yeah, it. Maybe I'll good. play the sound a bit in the beginning. So this was done with a yeah. collaborator that I've worked with for the first few few years of doing kind of uh, more like public art projects. Daniel Davidovsky is a wonderful mm -hmm. sound artist and musician. Uh, he's based in Tel Aviv. That's where I was mm -hmm. living at the time in Israel. Mm -hmm um and we just we would do we were performing a lot we got into this you know because that's how people <laughs> that come from sound and music do right uh, which is very yeah. different right coming from visual art and still right and film and so on my projects take years and it's like whenever i show something it's like a big deal uh but mm -hmm. you know with daniel we had this practice of performing every couple of weeks or something right, right. so there's like an immediacy and you're kind of prototyping things really quickly and you're able yeah. to kind of experiment yeah yeah, yeah and there yeah. so there would be these systems that i would build so this we were all like custom made kind of live performance systems um mm. that I would build using max msp and uh, they're yeah. all built using um yeah using kind of 3d essentially 3D as a scaffolding for working with video in this very right. special or kind of uh, layered, tangible way. Mm -hmm. I would also have these interactive interfaces uh, that I would use that I would build mm -hmm. to kind of like manipulate it in different ways. So kind of mm -hmm. pull and push it apart. I would I'd use all kinds of weird stuff like strings mm -hmm. you can pull. Uh, oh, it was right. like an interactive golf controller. I had like joysticks, <laughs> force feedback joysticks or yeah. tablets or all kinds of things like that. Because uh, it was all about having this tangible uh, way of work, working with video. Um, I, there's this uh, quote from Namjoon Pike that I love about um, wanting to make video with the fingers. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that was my thing. Mm. Uh, it was that, that was that, that's how I got to working with 3D essentially is that it was um, it's a kind of interface between my body and this world of interesting humans. interesting and like a haptic interface too right yeah yeah which, oh. which I feel is something that we used to hear about and think about more yes you know in terms of like interface devices and um in terms of you know like there used to be that 3d sculpting system with the, mm -hmm. haptic, the devices. haptic devices yeah. haptic devices totally yeah and yeah. i had a i used to have a space mouse i you know and now <laughs> it's just like we mouse and a mouse pad. Yeah, yeah 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 no it's interesting that that has changed I'm just realizing there is a weird timeliness to me showing this because the new Top Gun movie just came out oh <laughs> and this God. is using some excerpted <laughs> some of the footage there I stole from Top Gun. Um, That's, I love that. Um, if you saw right that that model that is being manipulated is a is a kind of um, abstraction of a fighter plane or I something see. like that. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. it was during uh, one of the many wars in Israel, and this was like mm -hmm. also commenting on that. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of there. You know, you could hear fighter planes in the sky and mm -hmm. drones and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and rockets and things. Um, so it was. Yeah, it was it, it was related. It was definitely influenced by that, right? So that's some yeah. of the materials you're seeing in there. Got it. And and that I world like, of kind of the gaming too, the shooter games uh, and yeah. military. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's also a good archive um, of that time. But it feels very contemporary too to right now. Like it doesn't. Like I could see this piece being made right now, and we're yeah, it's weird. The I was looking at it. There was a period in which it looked really like antiquated to me and then i looked at it yesterday and i was like oh it doesn't look like it was necessarily made that long ago except for the resolution i mean people are still <laughs> flying is... around and bombing other people it's like right. yeah that sadly hasn't gone away sadly sadly is still a reality yeah yeah so, yeah yeah so that's yeah that's kind of like where where some of my my work with 3d essentially mm. comes from okay interesting um, uh and, and and what yeah, and I thought I would I would follow that up with there is um I don't know Sophie no we didn't overlap in Chicago you didn't see that no I Chicago. think you graduated from SEOC before I arrived right but maybe just by yeah. a summer but this was this is uh like the first project I did coming to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh and it was yeah it was kind of like the the culmination of like the those first early years where I was doing all these live performances and all these projects in Israel that all were 
done live and then maybe sometimes turned into like that camo piece I showed you was also turned into a video, although I was never, yeah. I was much happier always with the live performance than with right. the video. Right, right, um, right. And um, tunneling was essentially kind of taking that to the next level and turning into kind of a system that I've, I've I'm still working with to this day. So it's my longest mm -hmm. running project. I mean, it's mm -hmm. since the first one I did in 2008 in Chicago. Uh, yeah. The most yeah. recent, the, what you're seeing the recording here, I'll show you a bit of that is mm -hmm. um, I, I did in Friedman Gallery in New York in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it is, is it's a system that essentially it's, um, again, it uses 3D as a scaffold. Like you don't see, uh, it, I mean, there, there is a bit of a three-dimensional effect in, in it, but it, it uses essentially all these floating, floating planes, essentially, in 3D space that you're mm -hmm. seeing through uh, and to create this infinite tunnel that's projected on the wall of the performance mm -hmm. space. So it's essentially mm -hmm. the, it's the appearance of me tunneling through the wall of the space. Ah, um, okay. You know, as I'm, as I'm. Oh, I we know. just had Surabi. She was our last guest. Amazing. Oh, yeah. There she is right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my yeah. goodness. That oh, was well, a great one. Too. A perfect order of episodes then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I collaborated both with her and with Danielle. That was my the collaborator mm -hmm. I mentioned previously on that, on doing the sound for this performance, the early versions mm -hmm. of that. And mm -hmm. then after that project with Surabi, actually, I switched to doing it as a solo, uh, solo mm -hmm. project. That's how it's been running for the past few years. Um, and I want, I mean, the, the, the reason I wanted to show that was kind of like the way I, 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 I wasn't thinking about 3D necessarily when I was making all these projects, but I was really kind of engaging one by one with all these like elements of it and that, mm -hmm. you know, um, this idea of uh, textures, right? And this idea of like, skins that you kind of wrap around things mm -hmm. and so on um was was something i was super interested in those years uh yeah. and still i'm in different ways uv maps the aesthetics of uv mapping and like texturing is is so to me it has so much richness mm. um conceptual richness yeah. that can be explored i mean titian su is one of my favorite artists and he uses that really well with some mm. of his sculptures and videos oh. Oh, I love, yeah, I'm a sucker for that. Oh, I'd love, to, I'd love yeah. to see his work, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll go back to the recording to, to write. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a file or a cool. link to his his file. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was doing, I was looking for that, actually, and I was thinking about it. I couldn't find it. But I, some of the earliest stuff I did in Chicago where I was really interested in, um, I was doing a lot of stuff with slit scanning systems that I was uh, developing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, which... If I should explain, it's basically yes, when you use one, <laughs> one vertical column of or horizontal column of pixels, essentially. And instead of um, uh, instead of taking multiple frames one after another, like taking uh, uh, right, that's how video works, right? So if one frame after another, instead within the same frame, you're essentially uh, staggering uh, uh, columns, right, or or rows. So you're getting kind of a scan over time. Uh, you're mm. condensing kind of space and time into one image, essentially. Mm, interesting. Um, so I was doing that with um, with really lo long kind of building blocks and things like that. And I was doing that in Tel Aviv in one way and then differently in Chicago. In Tel Aviv, I was doing it vertically and Chicago was doing it horizontally. Uh, mm -hmm. But but that what you would get is this unwrapped building, essentially, right? Which was oh, like, yeah. oh, yeah, UV map. UV right? maps. <laughs> totally. I mean, that's um, what drew me to 3D in the beginning is like, so I came from photography and I was doing architectural photography. And then I just, this idea that you could kind of like warp space, you could take a real space and input it and you could warp it or you could kind of change material or like visualize it according to different physics, I guess, or different optics. Mm -hmm in a mm -hmm. way that you can't do in the camera. That's what pulled me into 3D. This is just an example of those scanning inspired kind of videos. So that's a, it's a long series I made over quite a few years in different cities around the world. Um, and um, that was, again, that was through moving one or more cameras, essentially. Mm -hmm. Initially it was on a bike. Um, ah. trying to, so kind and of you're like, just capturing a strip at a time, right? As you're moving through. Space yeah. So those are like together. delayed frames from a bicycle, essentially. Yeah. 
um, and then they were like re-wrapped around you in space, right? So like in, in, a, in an immersive space, right? So that way you're kind of like in this moving, you're inside the movement of the mm -hmm. vehicle, kind of inside that space. So I was thinking of it as a kind of anti-Google map. Uh, yeah, Google right. Speaking, not Google map. Because basically yeah. it's like it ex the space expands and contracts based on how fast you move through it, essentially. Yeah, and you're inhabiting like a mechanical eye, you know, exactly. you're, you're yeah. like, yeah. Um, so there were different versions of it. There was a version with, um, with people too. Uh, mm -hmm. where which was like a unit of people um carrying carrying cameras on them carrying these um strange gimbals that i built on yeah. <laughs> on them and um kind of documenting a whole neighborhood kind of a view that breaks apart mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah they're so immersive and and definitely relating to the body in a really interesting way i don't know i'm trying I'm... to do it semi-chronologically because weirdly i have been um moving more and more towards working with more like literally like i'd call it like synthetic 3d or whatever you want to yeah. call it uh in the last few years and part of it was this thought process um that started a few years ago and i wrote i did um i, I my contribution to this uh, wonderful uh, uh you know book that sophie i know you also contributed to i don't know Claire, mm -hmm. if you're the 3D Additivist uh, cookbook. Ah, uh, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. The additive uh, that Martian did with um, Martian and Daniel, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah, it was yeah, the Additivist yeah. Manifesto, and then they followed that with um, yeah, kind yeah. of recipes. It was based on the Anarchist cookbook, is that right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that was the idea, right. yes. Uh, yeah, this is a wonderful. And people can uh, still download this as a PDF, so this is available. Uh, online and we'll put a link we'll put yeah, a link definitely put a link it's an amazing uh amazing uh amazing book and mm -hmm. i don't know if we can probably find sophie's thing here somewhere uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> yes oh <laughs> that's amazing there we go on preserving glitch there we go oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, wait when did this yeah. come out oh man it was a few years, years ago, ago. Actually, yeah, and actually, this is no longer current in what I tell oh. people to do, and Rhino doesn't work anymore. So, ZBrush oh, really? Dynamic Subdivision, FYI, if anyone. Oh, wait, I, I got <laughs> kicked out of it. I'll post like an update. But yeah, no, let's let's focus on <laughs> all these projects. I was like, oh, maybe I'll give this work in progress or that. And then I was like, no, I just want to write something, which is weird because I don't do a lot of writing and English mm -hmm. isn't my native language either. So it's mm -hmm. it's a semi cringy piece of writing, but there are some like interesting mm -hmm. elements to it, right? So it mm -hmm. was it was basically kind of trying to take to an extreme this idea of like um, digitization and 3D printing. So the both ends of like interfaces with the physical world, right? So like yeah. what happens with, because I was, I, I the one type of 3D I've worked with really uh, mostly is more like, uh, the photogrammetry end of things or the kind of yeah. like uh, post photography or whatever you want to call it right that kind of approach um mm -hmm. i saw you had chris coleman on last so you know definitely yeah. a, more in, a bit more yeah. in that direction um yeah. but 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 more live right more related to kind of what i was doing with those live projects right so yeah so i that's... love this the capture a glomerator <laughs> Generates it was just a bunch of speculative sector. devices. <laughs> yeah, right? but I mean, I think this is actually quite a common thread and like a lot of artists yeah. who are working around this technology, like, because I think that my sculptures are infospectors of the body, you know, that, mm -hmm. and there's this sense that the capture, and I feel like this comes back to histories of photography where we have come to understand, you know, that there is no such thing as a reliable documentation of the truth and that the technology itself is actually maybe doing damage as it's capturing, you know, that like the act of capture can be violent and can potentially be non-consensual and can, you know, have power relationships involved. So, you know, talking about like something that gathers information but damages that information is a, I think quite a, a sharp way to like to critique some of these capture technologies that we're working with too yeah and it's um there is I'm trying to remember the name of the book there's a book I was reading at the time I think that was influencing that too it's called I think it's called to be a machine 
So it's, it's a really mm. cool book. It's this uh, Irish journalist that basically spent a couple of years uh, living with all the kind of transhumanist communities he could manage. Uh, and, uh, you know, people Re to cryogenics and to try to like- Yeah, or the hand shit implants, or, like, right? Yep, yep, um, yep, yep. And you know, that one of the things there is that, yeah, the really the, the, the only method people could figure out to, for example, really potentially uh, like scan a brain is to destroy it, right? That's how yep. you, you scan any kind of biological- Yes. Issue. Um, yes, absolutely. If you take this logic of scanning that is happening everywhere, and you know, my my uh, one of my biggest fascinations for the past few years has been those like uh, rapidly growing archives of like scans of right the quick cell mega scans and those kind mm. of things, right? Which I know Colette uses. Uh, like oh a lot of yes, online scan I use um, in the scan world. the world, scan the world on um, my mini factory, which is in a huge archive of scans of antiquities from scanners around the world. Uh -huh. It's like an open source um, resource. I use it um, in my sculpture process. I because I'm kind of doing an assemblage like process with all of these different open source scans. I turn them into brushes essentially. Mm -hmm. So they're kind mm -hmm. of like brush strokes for me in ZBrush. Mm. Um, but that access has kind of opened up a whole new world for me and, and it keeps growing. So it's like this kind of, as my work evolves and that evolves, there's just this kind of yeah. symbiotic there's relationship with that. There's something so crazy and fascinating to me about these like databases of, um, you know, this one particular corner of Arizona or this one place in like, you know, it's like mm. you got this sampler of like physicality of places, right? Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. particular materials and textures and right, all of that. And and that's rapidly growing in order to create these synthetic environments, right? And and mm -hmm. and these days to also feed uh, AI systems, right? Because, yeah, you know, there's I I could talk about scanning all day, so this is the only reference I want to drop in. Otherwise, I'm going to be talking like that for another hour. Um, but there's an <laughs> article by Jeff Manoff, who used to I I it might still yeah. maintain yeah, building yeah. blog. Do you know no, the one about King Tut? about the um, Factum Arte who digitized King Tut's tomb to make a kind of tourist attraction. So you could go in and not damage it, you know, because uh -huh, if you uh -huh. actually open it up that, you know, the atmosphere or whatever, it's going to damage it. I think they did something similar with the Lesko oh, case. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of his books and I love his blog, but I didn't, I'll send you I this article because yeah. this article was like amazing for my thinking about my own work, but he talks about like, digitizing the world and I think also maybe the Smithsonian effort to digitize everything in their collection mm -hmm. in 3D but he talks about this like existential horror that what if the scan has a glitch and the scan has an error and then it like continues to proliferate and be copied and this is our archive of the world and then the it gradually accumulates kind of glitch and error as it is copied and copied and copied well, and um the, I, I'll post a quote. I'll post it in well, there. To me, the, the kind of comments. like the, the the squared version of that horror, which is, I think, what's happening very soon or now is right. Mm -hmm. It's like the version of the right. There's right now the giant image databases, right, that feed mm -hmm. like, you know, Mid Journey and whatnot mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. obviously there's going to be I mean, there's already in, in R&D, but there's going to be uh, the kind of publicly available 3D version of that, right? Yeah. So um, that uses those scanned databases, right? Those yeah. are going to be, that's what's going to feed it, right? It's, you're mm -hmm. going to have these millions of scanned photogrammetry kind of uh, materials yeah. that are used to feed systems that generate assets, right? On yeah. The end. yeah. But those yeah. assets yeah. will be third hand, right? Yes. And then <laughs> uh, more so, yeah. And there'll yeah. be fourth hand and fifth hand, right? Because they'll be yeah. generated. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. It's like a game of telephone, but on an epic scale. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like... <laughs> and then you're going to have these like, uh, you know, resurrected versions of like what, I don't know, the American prairie used to look like, uh, you know, 30,000 years ago, but like yeah. not, right? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. anyway, yeah. it's an interesting rabbit hole. Well, it's like looking, yeah. it's also like kind of remembering your life through photographs and like you know the those captures aren't quite full portraits of what was going on and they're still they're still removed there's like a you know a level of removal every time you do a version of yeah. um a photograph and then it comes to replace your own memory too you yeah know? yeah exactly yeah, yeah. like yeah it's a 
Yeah, that's very fascinating. And I have a question. Was the the portals that you were showing, is that the machine you were talking about that creates a disembodied experience? The portals, which portals? You were showing the those like- tunneling? The yeah, the oh, tunneling. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 that wasn't it. Uh, but th- okay. uh, this is an early prototype of that. Ah, <laughs> wow. wow. Um, that's from like, I was, um, I was recently doing a talk about it uh and wait is this which one came first maybe this one came no i don't remember which one came first maybe this one uh i was doing a talk about it so i found these really old these kind of like um there's they're from a proposal i made somebody asked me to participate in this um traveling museum that's a it is a very cool project that's happening in israel the past few years which is Mm -hmm. uh past 10 years or so which basically pop, it's like a pop-up museum that shows up in um, usually in places that are more remote from the big museums uh, and but works there for a few months with you know the local environment and community and kind of does all these um, projects invites artists to do projects there and oh, so on. Cool. So um, for that initial version of that they were going to use containers like shipping containers Mm -hmm. uh, and they basically asked me to make a proposal for a shipping container so my proposal was up on its side right vertically Uh create a system where you can so this was based on (laughs) to give slight context slight tangent uh, yeah. This was based on, uh, I was doing a lot of work with drones on the few years before that, because again, I was interested in them as these kind of surrogate bodies, mm. uh, as a kind of, you know, how they essentially represent a lot of what people aspire to in terms of, you know, if you think about angels or spirits or things like that, right? Mm-hmm. There's something that flies around the world and can kind of mm-hmm. like intervene on your behalf, or it can see, mm-hmm. right? It can tell you what's going on or influence mm-hmm. things and it has a yeah body. it's another mechanical like a disembodied mechanical eye that promises a yeah. kind of power well in fact it, there yeah. were you know there were drone there there were um the early there's an early there's a biblical chapter that talks about the forms of angels it's in a book of oh, Ezekiel. yeah yeah one yeah, of the angels that are described kind of- there is a mechanical angel it's really weird it's like surrounded yeah. by uh it's a it's a circle it's it's a bunch of spinning circles mm-hmm. that are covered in eyes and wings all yes. over that are yes. all spin can, and the, it can be possessed by the human shaped angel that can see through it and tell it where to go <laughs> right so that's like the literal so i built i had a whole project where i built uh you know i built a version i built a i built a drone that was kind of representing that and would fly around and pray in a gallery and it was kind of creepy, but also, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, something beautiful about it. And I Mm -hmm. worked with a guy who, who was interested in, in flying drones as a means of leaving your body and as a means of prayer, it was this born again, Christian guy. uh, um, So we did a project called lessons on leaving your body together. So that's Mm -hmm. what led me to building this because I was like, all right, I want to give the audience the, 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 uh, opportunity to go through what he uh was going through right in his mm-hmm. experience so this is a machine that allowed you to actually kind of like see the world from your own perspective initially and then this weather balloon flies out of this uh, uh, and, and there's a camera this, in the balloon yeah, is that right yeah yeah so it's like a first person view so this isn't a vr headset this is just like a video monitor right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh on his face right but like uh, and then you fly out and so you slowly kind of see yourself from above and so on um I didn't build that, but I did build this. That, that was in a residency in Sedona quite a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And and that was essentially that, right? It was like a mechanism that allowed you to view yourself kind of slowly departing your body. And it was a really, there was something really mm-hmm. beautiful about that experience because we would have these um, really intimate conversations. I, me or somebody else was cranking the <laughs> the thing that was lifting the camera up right as people were leaving their bodies they were just talking about what they're feeling and what they're seeing and it was it was surprisingly deep Uh, just the well just the idea or the like kind of the the phrase leaving your body Uh is so loaded you know emotionally for all of us with you know conversations around mortality that there's no way you're not going to have those deeper conversations in relationship with that particular piece i mean that is such a 
I, I love the also just the mechanical angel that you're talking about. I, I really want you to send us the link to <laughs> that sure. writing um, because that is, I, I mean, this also, your work uh, really weaves in a lot of the kind of um, stories and kind of the different physical details from different religions and belief systems because there are like, you know, going up a mountain, you know, like, you know, these specific things that are experienced in a lot of these religious um, documents. And it seems like you're kind of deconstructing those and then recreating them in this, per, you know, 21st century experience and, mm -hmm. and kind of giving people a chance to step back, meditate a little, experience those things now. What does that mean now with these tools? Yeah, that's that interesting. Any... Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, and it, so it's like the the I'll show you. So again, you're 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 at prescient. You're like <laughs> so. <laughs> what I'm saying is like uh, okay, good. So the version of this that finally saw the light of day and kind of toured around the world and and a bunch of people experienced was called Titchener's Cage, and that ended up being a VR piece, right? Which was mm -hmm. it was totally coming to VR by the back door again. This weird direction <laughs> because mm -hmm. I just needed a way. I couldn't you know, carry around that giant, like, you know, <laughs> all that apparatus, right? yes. this thing is like, you can't yeah. really do that, right? I needed it to a theater to install it in. And it was like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so how are you gonna so I was just sitting there thinking, how can I give people that experience in a way that's portable, and that you can kind of but you can still have some version of that. So that's how I got to working with VR. But the thing that was really important for me is that your body is part of the experience because I was reading a lot. It was right when the first kind of Oculus sets were coming out, um, yeah. the first consumer ones were coming out and so on. I was even experimenting with the one before that, the kind of developer's version before that. But um, and, you know, I was like I was trying to understand how um, how you could make your body a part of the experience because everything I saw, all the hype I saw about VR, which I found really disturbing a lot of it, the kind of like uh, empathy machine kind of hype that's, I mean, it's been Yeah, I was a bit, I, that was on my list of questions to ask you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that this, this sense that if you can, somebody can experience what it's like to be a refugee right. for two it's minutes like through, you know, a headset, then that will, magically you know guarantee them some sort of understanding of, of exactly another person's life yeah yeah There's so that a was a lot of problems in that. a lot of yeah. problems <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and it's been, you know, since then, luckily, there's, there's been enough years that now there's even scientific research that disproves that, right? People have actually have come up with results that. that kind of like, clearly show that there's no, first of all, what is empathy? And second, even if you like, so called generate, whatever they define as empathy, that doesn't mean at all that there would be any impact or any. It, so even in the very narrow kind of pretty capitalistic terms that he was yeah. using it in, it doesn't even make sense, right? So, yeah. Um, but I was interested in what it means to encounter another person, kind of another person's ghost almost, or like trace and presence mm -hmm. in a way that's really, really visceral and really physical, right? As physical mm -hmm. as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And part of a physical experience, and that's through, through reading about what empathy is, right? I, I got to the initial definitions of it, which were in the 19th century, um, and was translated to English by... Uh, Edward Titchener is a psychologist mm -hmm. uh, and um, kind of early psychologist, right? And then, and and the, the the initial meaning of that was the sensation you feel in your body uh, in response to another person's experience mm -hmm. or, or even an object. It was even used mm -hmm. in relation to objects, not even just people, um, mm -hmm. which is really interesting thinking about your both of your work too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right but it's Objects, like yeah <laughs> i mean you know like physical or right, tangible things uh and so, so it focuses on your embodied sensation and to me it was clear that if you can't have that if you don't have a body right uh mm -hmm. if you're in this vr experience but you have no body you're this disembodied like bodiless mm -hmm. thing it's how are you gonna you're not gonna experience really um you know, your brain isn't going to be fooled into thinking you're physically present anywhere. Mm. Um, 
So that was that was part of it, what led to it. So I'll, I'll show you maybe a bit. And then I do for this, I do have a bunch of working files and things I can show you. Oh, fantastic. Well. Um, so I'll show you. I've, I've actually, when Sophie yeah. had her solo show in VR and mm -hmm. she was a bird and I was some sort of uh -huh. strange avatar. And uh -huh. this was during the pandemic. And I was standing in my bedroom with my cat at my feet, you know, in the headset, the rift, um, uh -huh. talking to Sophie for an hour in her exhibition, there was, yeah. I, I have to say, I did feel a bit of a physicality and I have yeah. a memory of that experience in a physical way. For and sure. Very fond memory of talking to Sophie as mm -hmm. a, as a bird. Yeah. Well, could, so she was a, so, and did you have an avatar too or no? I did. I think it was just a generic, like, was like one of those. Mozilla hubs. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, no, first of all, like that's The little why, guy with a Christmas yeah. sweater on. But that's yeah, why avatars body. exist, right? So yeah. you did have, if you look down, you saw something, right? There yes. wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> you, and, and it yeah. was responding to you. It was like in real time, right? So it wasn't, yeah. um, whereas if you look at all those 360, early 360 videos, the Chris Milk kind and so on, mm -hmm. you, you had, they went to great length to even erase the camera, right? So there was mm -hmm. nothing there, right? You look down, there isn't even a tripod or anything. You're yeah. just kind of a disembodied, presence floating through a refugee camp or something mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> and it wasn't live so right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't have wild. a conversation right and it's on right. the other side of the world so there are all these different problems right and what i was interested with this project was like all right how can you like do the total opposite of that you know i mean i wasn't thinking about that right it was coming more from wanting to make an out-of-body experience machine mm. but afterwards i was like all right yeah i'm actually making kind of the opposite of that because mm -hmm. um because actually I'll, I'll let you listen to this guy because he's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but basically the idea was uh, have recordings, uh, have little recording sessions in different, uh, when, wherever it's installed. It was open as a recording studio, essentially only for a few days. And people mm -hmm. would come and essentially leave message for nobody, for like a ghost, for mm. whoever is going to come there. And those messages could be anything. It could be very physical. It could be something they do or sing or tell a story or bring props or whatever. I would even go away for, I would get out of the room and they were just there on their own. Um, and then it would open to the public who would come there and see. So the VR kind of uh, uh, specters they would confront were from there, right? From the same place, right? Where they are or from some of the previous places it traveled in. Um, and there was another thing which it allowed you to leave your body, but I'll, I'll show you a bit of a recording where for kind of, this is all first person kind of live mm -hmm. recording of somebody using the, the installation. And this is a volumetric capture. Right here. And he I'll start. This is the place between heaven and hell. And you don't have any of your stuff with you. Your stuff that you hold on to, that you buy, that you waste money on. Are you in love? Okay. Turquoise. Turn. Go away. Now you start floating out of your body, right? And it, you can, so, so the only interaction kind of you have is you're, you're able to, you're, you, get, you get an instructional thing from the person at the beginning who puts you into the experience, but basically you can press that button, which essentially untethers you from your body. And then if you just move a little bit, you lean back or lean forward or to the side, you essentially kind of dislocate yourself, right? You start mm. floating out of, your point of view starts floating out of your body. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, this is my body as I'm holding the button and kind of, because mm -hmm. I'm walking backwards, I'm also floating backwards there. Right. Ah, uh, right. Um, How did people respond after they came out of it? What were some of the reactions that you heard? Oh, here you're seeing some. <laughs> um, it was very much along the lines of like, I mean, first of all, it was interesting, even the stuff that people did in the recordings, because I always let mm. them experience it before they made a recording, right? So they know what they're mm -hmm. getting into. And, um, and they were very much um, thinking about death and thinking about limbo and thinking about, you know, those kinds of things, right? <laughs> Memory, uh, trauma, 
all kinds mm. of things. Um, or, you know, or just being weird or, or silly, right? It was all yeah. of those things, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you've got, so this is just like, you know, all just for a bunch, right? I think I have maybe 80 or something mm -hmm. people that I've recorded for this. So this is just like an example of what the recorded sessions looked like. Um, that's not mm -hmm. right. When you're in VR, you're not seeing that. You're just seeing these disembodied figures kind yeah. of manifest around you slowly. The longer you stay in there, the more of them appear. And and uh, but they don't all appear at once. They kind of like mm. get one after the other kind of slowly. And but their stories get more intimate, or the things they share with you go get more, mm. or they get even physically a bit closer. Um, so it gets you know, it gets deeper the longer you stay in there. Essentially, yeah. That makes sense. It's kind of the, it's like the opposite of the artist is present. It's like the artist is untethered or disembodied, you know, <laughs> like, because I, I'm thinking like even the way you had it framed where you're seeing the participants in addition to the inside world. And there was something so powerful about just seeing people's reaction to having this like super famous artist sit with them, you know, mm -hmm. um, and in this kind of expectation of aura and expectation of like kind of um I don't know some sort of magical or powerful presence and then this is the opposite where it's like people are being present with nothingness or being present yeah. with the idea of these specters what so it is the opposite but it's also not because there was something super intimate about it right because you're kind of right. alone in a room with this ghost and that those ghosts can get really intimate right they if you and that's why I gave you that's another reason you have well, first of all, it's a room scale experience, so you can get up and walk around, mm. right? But, and, you know, when those ghosts can come and sit right next to you, right? Like this, right? They're right in your face. Ah. And your body responds like that, right? Your body thinks that somebody, so you have this, you know, this, what, what you've all experienced, right? With somebody sitting right next to you and talking to you softly and looking into your eyes, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm, it's a, mm -hmm. or even sitting where you're sitting, which is a very strange experience. So your bodies are kind of, intertwined right mm -hmm. um that's a very odd kind of sensation um, they're also in your head they're in your head and the sound right so everything is spatial right so the sound is mm -hmm. 3d right so you can hear them whisper in your ear on the right or behind you or what have mm -hmm. you um mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in that way it's also yeah it's it's really um uh, visceral kind of thing mm, yeah but it's interesting to think about it in terms of time as well you know like the way that photography or film can also do that can like layer traces of time and record something that happened in a space in the past and then allow the person in that space to experience it in the present I feel there was mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember I think we had a lecture from um did you ever meet with like Mark Downey or open-ended group? They were doing some kind of volumetric capture too. And yeah. they had some, yeah, uh, they had talked a bit about that, about being able to kind of, you know, tag with information. I might be mis misremembering it, um, but about volumetric film being able to kind of store different types of narratives. Yeah, and to totally. experience narratives in a nonlinear way. Mm hmm. Yeah, 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 we had them. Yeah, we had them. Uh, we had them as uh, artists in residence actually a few years ago. Oh, cool. <laughs> really yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and they have this beautiful, I don't know if they still maintain it. They had this beautiful software that they built themselves to do a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I totally, totally uh, believe in that. Yeah, I think there's something really, uh, there's something really powerful about volume. Yeah, this kind of volumetric approach um, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and it was, you know, to show you the, <laughs> I can open, this was also done 100% in Max, uh, yeah. which, you know, it won't be, you won't see very much if I open the Max file, I found it, but it was just like, you know, it's not, it needs to be connected to the whole system, right? To like a VR yeah. headset and have That's all That's fine, but we're happy to see but, it. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's basically a lot of patch cords you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, that's really no, early perfect. version. It's great to see, you know we love to see kind of under the hood of any yeah. project yeah. no matter what the what the visuals are okay fine um, oh yeah that's their most recent one but it was it's a whole system right so it was like um yeah. it, it was made to be operated too by people um that are not you know be, I, I would set it up in a in various places and then it would need to be operated mm -hmm. by an attendant or something like that mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. that was that was also a you know Result yeah, so it's like a, like an active interfaces. living, yeah, 
yeah yeah, yeah. so there's um, like so these... we're coming yeah we're coming up on an hour um but yeah. i wanted to be sure if you had any oh yeah i want to show yeah. you actually the, the the biggest project but yes i, I yes, did please. i'll just show you here just to so understand in terms of uh, file structure <laughs> Yeah. Uh, since you were asking about that, this is probably the project where it's easiest to see how that kind of thing works. But uh -huh. um, it has, I mean, it's a massive project and it had, I've had different directories for the kind of running files, the kind of like live yeah. performance or event files, the programming mm -hmm. side of things, which is what mm -hmm. you see here, which is the much more messy part. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the kind of um, archive part, which had to be super organized because everything is dependent on everything yeah. else, which, you know, from Otherwise 3D it's, projects. it all falls apart, yes. Mm -hmm. This is all like oh, a, home, yeah. a home world kind of system, but essentially mm -hmm. the way the recording on that worked is I would both capture a video. It was done from a Kinect 2. Mm -hmm. um, so there would be videos. The videos were in... Um, like a homemade format too. So they weren't even in a format mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. would make sense. Like if I open it, you'll see it just looks like, uh, it doesn't look like, it looks like this, right? Oh, right. That's beautiful <laughs> though, in a different yeah. aesthetic. Yeah, it's, I had to invent my own kind of compression essentially for that. So uh -huh. that's why it looks like this because it's essentially saving a depth image. That was before... Uh, the right. kind of depth kit stuff that's out now. Even yeah, though I was going to mention that too with James George and Scatter mm -hmm. and that those projects. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was before it was in parallel, but what they were doing, I was actually talking. I even talked with them about it, and they were doing. They still are doing something that's not aimed at real time. It's aimed at um, uh, right. you know, post production. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't appropriate for this. So I had to mm -hmm. make roll my own essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so you're recording a video and ambisonic sound. Uh -huh. and uh tracking the person uh -huh. so i had to make a file format that just tracks where a person is in space right. and, and then combine all of those in a way that makes sense you know so the sound isn't coming from one place and you know yeah. video from another and all that yeah so, yeah so there's uh, nothing off the shelf that would do this you had to build the tools yeah, exactly yeah. and then yeah. i had to curate groups of videos which is what i have here is like the different like categories of um mm -hmm. of things and so on so mm -hmm. yeah that's right. amazing yeah <laughs> see why that was five years in the oh that yeah. wasn't five years that was that was quick that was like a few oh, months. okay oh, wow. <laughs> that's that that's a small project yeah <laughs> oh man <laughs> that would have taken me five years <laughs> the, <laughs> the big one was yeah it was a project called chronicle of a fall which i where do I have? Oh, I, I just call, closed VLC player, of course. Um, but I'll show you a brief. We're still editing the documentation from it. Yeah. But um, you know what I'll do? I'll actually show you the website first. Um, so this is a, a document. It started as a feature, essentially documentary feature mm -hmm. film uh, that I collaborated on with Tirza Evan, who's a... Mm -hmm. Wonderful um, experimental filmmaker. Yeah, she nurse. was my advisor for a semester too at grad school. Just my Yay. first semester. <laughs> yeah, she's great. And we, you know, we had this thing where we we never actually met when I was in um, at SAIC because uh, mm. she only came there after I left. Mm -hmm. But oh. you know, we connected through mutual friends, and and we just kind of for years were trying to find something to work on together. And mm. um, after Trump was elected, we were both like okay, we have to do this film. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so it started then and it ended uh, this past spring. Uh, and in the process, it got turned into a massive installation instead of a mm -hmm. film. Um, but it's still feature length. It's like something like two hours long mm -hmm. if you watch everything in the project. Mm -hmm. um, and Wow. It, yeah, no, it, it, that did take five years for a reason. <laughs> Uh, that's very and, ambitious and it's it's essentially um oh amazing a, a, a the a, the a, looking at what home is is really was the driving question it's based on a film called chronicle of a summer by a filmmaker called jean roche so that's mm -hmm. that's a frame from the original film uh mm -hmm. and that's from some of our production footage that we didn't end up including actually mm -hmm. but um but the idea in in summer in chronicle for summer he looks at, at, at what it, 
the, the driving question to people is, are you happy? And it's kind of a seminal film. It established this genre of cinema verite, and, but, but it meant something very different than what think, people think about these days when they hear that term, which is, mm. it did not mean fly on the wall, right? It meant like actually putting a camera in the middle of the room or putting a microphone right in somebody's face and actually having an, a real interaction with them around that. Mm. So not pretending that the camera doesn't exist or something like that. Yeah. Um, and the idea was that it's the truth that the camera generates. It's not the truth that the camera reveals. It's two very different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, so we were interested in doing that too, but uh, also with a group of our friends and acquaintances and all people working in art in different ways and all people that immigrated to the U.S. from the mm -hmm. Middle East mostly and some other mm -hmm. uh, kind of countries that Trump doesn't like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the first conversations that led to it was actually with Morishin that was mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. See her here? Yeah, I thought I recognized <laughs> her in the video, uh, yeah. Around, around um, well, she was like literally stuck in Europe for right when yes. we were starting this. With, uh, Beza, with the ban, yeah. right, and all that. Yeah. And uh, just this feeling of deja vu that a lot of people were experiencing who came here from another place that was kind yeah. of like teetering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. we were trying to, we were asking people basically, what is home to you? How do you experience home? Um, you know, how do you make a home for yourself here? And we were recording all these really intimate videos with people. You see, they're all wearing GoPros and mm -hmm. interacting just with their partners or, you know, mm. sometimes with us, but it's not, there's no talking head interviews or anything like that. It's kind of people living their lives and talking to each other about those questions or sometimes mm -hmm. even to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, singing all kinds of things are happening there uh and the idea was we really wanted again for this to be a really embodied experience for the audience so we wanted people to like go in and actually um here i'll actually do, 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 i'll talk over that go in and actually inhabit those spaces that they call home right so instead mm -hmm. of just um kind of uh just kind of like um mm -hmm. hear from them about it we wanted, we wanted you to, to be in this space, to kind of literally step into the space that there is something fragmented and ghostly about it, but it's, and it's this mashup of different places, but that is the kind of home that those people inhabit, essentially. Mm. Um, and I realized in talking about it that I haven't actually kind of shown you the finished installation, uh, which would be a good kind of place to start from when we look at the real kind of materials. So I thought I would start with that, show you what it's like when you kind of walk into the space as it was, it was just installed once so far because we just wrapped this project in April and we basically already showed it a month later um, at Gallery 400 in Chicago. So this is very preliminary documentation from there. The show just came down recently. So uh, we're still kind of editing the full trailer uh, but I'll show you kind of an early phone based essentially version uh, that just gives you a feel of what the space is like and keep in mind you're not going to hear the dialogue right because that's what happens when you walk into the space you're immersed in this kind of um, really kind of uh, surround soundscape uh, of this world that we've built out of fragments of the kind of home uh, spaces of our different participants uh and then you have to kind of commit and go in there and sit on those benches that you're seeing in this image already and um look at the back side of those screens and put on headphones and that's where you can hear the dialogue uh from our different participants uh so you're not going to hear that but i will play uh, a couple of samples of that for you uh, after i play this so this is what the space is like when you come in essentially he has on and hear that uh, but what you're sharing the experience you're sharing with the person sitting on the benches you see the room you're seeing move around you is the same room that the conversation is happening in. 
just like the trees you're seeing here are the same trees that uh, Ishin, the participant whose video is on that screen, um, you'll see her biking through this, this uh, forest. And you can hear her voice. Her voice does bleed through when she's singing. That does bleed through from the video on the screen to the kind of wider world around it. You can't hear what she's talking about, but because she chose to sing in that moment, we let the sound kind of come out of the headphones and into the space. So he's still hearing her singing in the headphones. So you notice the voice speaking there too. And again, that was um, one of our participants, Sajaki uh, is also a poet. So this was a poem that he wrote uh, in, in response to um, George Floyd's murder actually. And it was um, something that he chose to share with us when we were talking with him. Uh, and, <clears throat> and again, we let that kind of lead out into the wider space. Uh, so our, it just so happened that all of our participants chose to share some song or music with us. We didn't ask them for that. It was really beautiful that they just did that. Did that. Um, and we, we decided that those were key moments that connected kind of the worlds, right? So you can see another moment like that here. You see, it's the same time code, right? And this is this is what gets projected. This is a single screen version of what gets projected on the entire space at the same time that this you're seeing this video on uh, this the rear of one of the screens. Oh, sorry, I'll actually start a little bit before that, just so you know the context of what she's saying there not knowing when the next time would be. She feels so scared each time I go to the country. She's happier if I don't do it at all because of all this court cases and people being imprisoned all the time. All these friends. The circle gets smaller and smaller and she knows that it could be me next time. So not being able to see her daughter is more preferable for her than knowing that I'm in a prison. And every time I go, I scare her. About her mom here. Oh. <clears throat> She's still in Turkey. So 
So I just I wanted to get give you a sense of who are those people and what are those stories that I keep mentioning. And um, the same person, right, uh, Ishin, right, as that's happening on this video screen, this is what's playing kind of in the world around you, right, is essentially, wait, let me. So hopefully that gives a bit more of a sense of, of the way that experience is kind of layered and structured and there really it's there's this really kind of intense idea of bringing you into their world right this is this again this idea of embodied experience right of you not just kind of seeing a documentary on your tv screen or on a movie theater screen uh but instead stepping into the world that the people in it kind of uh experience right so um the way we the kind of way we got to this was essentially working with each each um each of our protagonists right basically chose a couple of sites that are kind of meaningful to them they are kind of home uh feel like home in some way or home away from home uh or right there isn't really a home often and that's part of the the, the thing so it's not really home away from home it's just some kind of home and those sites then uh, were scanned by us, right? So we went to those sites and we scanned them and we created a composite world. So we used Unity to do that. So I'm gonna show you a little bit behind the scenes of that, right? So basically um, each of those worlds was comprised of different scenes, different spaces that we scanned that the different scenes in our film take place in. Uh, that kind of have to do with two of the characters because you saw there are two screens hanging in the space. So uh, because two videos always play at the same time and it was a huge headache to just edit them so they're just the right length to match up, uh, but we did it. <laughs> then and with our amazing editor, by the way, uh, Stefan Oliveira Pita, who's an amazing uh, Berlin-based editor that we collaborated with for this. Uh, and Basically, uh, what we did once we had that locked down, the edit of two characters kind of playing at the same time, uh, we took all these scans we had of the different locations those scenes were shot at and edited them down, took various elements out, put different elements in. So there was a lot of compositing going on in very weird ways using very odd software. Um, and that ended up essentially in bits and pieces in Unity. That's where I did the final compositing and animation of this right so um what you're actually seeing projected in the space is an animation i rendered essentially offline um from unity um let me kind of show you a little bit of that so this is just kind of like trying to play um play with that animation a little bit uh, so it's, it's going to go a little slowly. Here we go. But I can I can skip along the path. But basically, the process was me uh, bringing in those really massive scans and kind of taking different parts out, situating some parts within other parts. So you're seeing this dinner table spinning inside the lake, right? There's a bunch of replicas of that. That's because um, there's another scene that happens at the dinner table between uh, Ishin and her life partner. Um, well, at the breakfast table, actually. Um, 
and they're having this really intimate moment around that so we wanted that to kind of in appear within the, this kind of lake that another scene takes place next to at the same time right so you're basically uh moving through this world uh while you can experience two different video scenes at the same time so this lake is a place where Ishin the woman riding the bike and another of our participants surely actually meet so we, we made sure they intersected that's something we borrowed from the original film from a chronicle of a summer where the different participants start to intersect and kind of meet during the film uh and we've done that with some of our participants so we arranged for them to meet by the pier uh on by the boathouse in uh, prospect park actually in new york uh and then um and because that's a place that's really meaningful uh for Shirley, right for our other participants so so we were able to kind of composite those two locations together so that they're fragments of home kind of that you're always immersed in and, and this is the forest that you saw us flying through uh, previously right so and that was also a process right just creating this right this was like uh three different layered particle systems right so you've got this kind of like ground cover which is basically totally made up that's not actually scanned at all um and then you've got um you know the the forms of the trees they're more like etching like or drawing like forms of the trees and then these more like ethereal particles that come off of them and um that was something you know that took me a long time just to kind of fine tune the way the different environments would appear and the way you'd have these kind of like reflection like situation in the lake and all those kind of different little little details that make it kind of come alive so um for example this is one of them so we use the visual effects graph which just came out basically as we were working on this project uh which is an amazing way to work with particles uh in unity and it's you know it uses this kind of patching structure which i was comfortable with because it's similar to max that you know i work with uh and it's also how you know all the geometry graph and all those other things work in blender and maya and so on these days uh so that's the kind of three different particle systems you're seeing here right it's uh you know similar to how it works in other software too but it, yeah that was that was really useful and you can see they're all being fed by these maps that are actually that that was a huge thing right that we were able to bring in those really heavy lidar scans into unity and they would actually run in unity and not crash and be able to generate these live particle systems which was just not possible to do without waiting forever in um software like blender at least not for somebody like me that is not like a blender master um and i'm really a real-time person so this was important for me to be able to see kind of what i'm working on and to be able to work with these photorealistic scans that include you know tens of millions of points right and create these worlds that are super rich with them um and so the tool that i used for that was a package called pcx um is uh from a coder called keijiro takahashi and he's he's amazing he's also an audiovisual kind of live audiovisual performer he uses unity to do live av performance and he works at unity too so he really knows what he's doing um and this is super amazing package and he's got a whole bunch of others i've used a few of his packages for this project because uh, he thinks in, in a similar way to me in this kind of real-time processing way um so just to nerd out a little bit on how that the end of that pipeline worked is or how it started and how it ended so it started with all these different lidar scans um they were brought into software called cloud compare well initially into autodesk recap until i realized that cloud compare is a open source amazing amazing project that can do things faster and better than uh, recap in many ways uh, so this is for example one of the raw scans fairly raw, I think so. I did some processing on it, of uh, this one place in Central Park that we use to create that kind of forest you're flying through in the scene I just showed you. And you see, I, I did a lot of things to it, right, before it ended up in Unity, right? T took out the ground and multiplied some of the trees and this and that. Uh, and you can do all of that here. You can really edit things and patch things together and composite parts of different scans and all of that. 
and a lot of other more fancier kind of stuff that's aimed at GIS folks and that sort of thing. People do measurements. So this is not art software <laughs> at all, but it's amazing. It's really powerful. Um, so I used that, brought the stuff into Unity, and then used Unity to essentially offline render because you can see it doesn't, it's not the highest frame rate right now already. Um, so I basically did offline rendering with Unity of uh, super high resolution kind of uh, shots, essentially, uh, of those multiple cameras, this cluster of cameras moving through this environment. And those were then taken to projection mapping software called MadMapper. Uh, and uh, from MadMapper, I was, I, I was mapping it onto the gallery space. There was one catch, which is uh, that I couldn't be in the gallery space, right? We had uh, only five days to install there in person. And this is a pretty complex project. We're talking about 12 projectors, right, um, for this installation. <laughs> And they all had to be perfectly synchronized and aligned and everything. So to do that, I actually used Unity as well. I used another instance of Unity. This is a smaller version of what I did for the show. So this is for a different version of this installation. So there were, you have to imagine even more projectors here. Uh, but that's essentially what I did. I created a simulation um, that was really pretty precise, right? It was based on precise floor plans of the gallery and based on this amazing package for Unity called Projector Simulator Pro by Simon White. And um, you can really, you can kind of get nitty gritty and you can like program the lens parameters of the exact projector model you're working with and all of that. So it's made for projection professionals. Uh, and it really does the job, right? So I, I was able to gauge like how bright the projections will be and how low we need to hang them and it would work if it would work with the ceilings have in the gallery and all that stuff. And I was able to actually send the images. So I was live mapping the images from um, here, sending them through this virtual video cable called the uh, spout in on Windows. Uh, to MadMapper and from MadMapper to virtual projector projectors in Unity, right? So on the visual, virtual project, projectors, it looked kind of like this, right? So wait, you don't need to hear me speak over this. This is from, uh, you know, we, we, we communicated with the gallery by recording various videos for them just to show them kind of what we're planning. That's from the early version. So this isn't mapped yet. Um, this is just to show them the coverage, but you can see that was that was a really useful tool and um, super nerdy and super meta to project on a virtual version of the gallery, but it worked. It really worked when we got to the space, we were actually able to put up the installation just in time and, um, and the experience worked most of all. That's what we were really um, kind of enthused about and all. Um, share with you a link to the project website where you can read more about it and the trailer the new trailer should be up there shortly but there is a pretty long kind of excerpt of different scenes with different characters and stories and so on that you can already browse there and there's a link at the top to uh the hyperallergic review that came out about the show which we were really excited about it was really uh, uh written by Lori waxman and she did a great job of uh, kind of encapsulating what the piece is about. Uh, think better than us. So yeah, thanks for letting me talk about this. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. This um, has been a really, yeah. a really cool episode, especially like getting a piece from 2007. That's a first, I feel like to kind of have <laughs> that context in a yeah. good way. Like, I think that that's a really important thing to talk about, like, well, what was going on then and, and how relevant it still is now. And also mm -hmm. just even the the type of, even though the technology maybe that you're using is different now, it, it has a relevance and a poignancy. Um, and I think that that talks about, you know, how does, because a lot of people are afraid to use different technologies. I've heard, well, well, doesn't it age badly? And it's like, 
I think any art can age badly if it's and not painting interesting. Painting can age and badly. Pay, yeah. Painting can definitely age badly. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it like styles can age, you know, they become trendy. But if you're just, you know, if it's a transformative piece of art, it's a transformative piece of art. Um, but yeah, and uh, so we are going to include as many of the links uh, that we're talking about today in the description for all of yeah. our viewers. Yeah, right. but and I'm you and, know I, I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, I I think I front loaded it with a lot of that stuff as we had <laughs> last time to uh, no! to going through the files of this recent project. But um, you know, I'm always happy to uh, to answer questions later. Yeah, yeah, well, for and sure. that's for, for viewers. For I definitely yeah. suggest, yeah, suggest that anybody watching definitely subscribe, like, and comment. And if you have follow up questions for Nadav or for Sophie or for myself, let us know and let us know if you have any suggestions for other guests. We want to hear from our viewers. And yeah, thank you everybody thank you for so watching much. File Exchange and for Nadav for taking the time here to share all of your work. And yeah, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.